This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? I'm doing great, man. I feel like we have a real treat here today. I think Identity at the Center is the the home of the Identity Legends. We've got another Identity Legend with us here today. This man, you look at his LinkedIn profile, it's like it's like if Tom Brady had a LinkedIn profile. Now, I know maybe I'm overhyping it a little bit, but he's also from Boston, so I figured, you know, there's a little bit of a connection there, but I mean, I don't want to give away all the details, right? That's what the show's for, but <laughs> I mean, this is going to be a fantastic episode. I mean, it's in the show title, so at this point, you really can't spoil it. But yeah, we, we definitely have uh, a great get today, as we like to say, the business. We've got another sponsor spotlight episode. For those who aren't aware, these are special episodes that we create with our sponsors. It's something we do in collaboration. It gives us more of an opportunity to kind of deep dive into special products, services, whatever it may be in the industry. So kind of gives us uh, you know a little more deeper than we would normally go in a, in a, in a normal episode. Um, so fully sponsored. Today's sponsor is Zilla Security. They are working on making identity security simple for all of us. And joining us today, we do have Deepak Taneja. He's a CEO and co-founder at Zilla Security. Welcome to the show, Deepak. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jim. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the podcast. So Jim mentioned that you're the you might be the Tom Brady of I am. I don't I that feels like that is either good or bad, depending on who you might be in the world, because there's a lot of love and hate <laughs> for Tom Brady. But let's start with your identity background, because it is long and illustrious, and we'll probably ask some questions about that along the way. But tell us a little bit, how did you get into the world of identity and access management? Is it something that you chose, or did it choose you? Yeah, well, thanks for the kind words first. Um, yeah, in the comparison with Tom Brady, I don't know about that. He's not he's not super popular in Boston these days. But um, So I got started in identity management back in the 80s. Um, I was a... Um, a developer uh, working on security and authentication and directory services uh, before there was a security space. Um, so, uh, and I found it intriguing. It was the idea that, um, you know, all of these network services, file services, print services, and so on, this was the early days of the internet, that they were all coming up. And the idea that at the center of it all was identity, was um, was super intriguing to me, and that's that's sort of what got me into it. So you've been working on identity for let's see, forty some years. I feel like Jim and I, you're like twenty years each. I, there's there's a lot of identity know how on this on this session <laughs> right now. I guess tell us a little bit more about Zilla Security. Um, you're a CEO and a co-founder. First of all, for people who aren't familiar with Zilla. Tell us about Zilla, and then tell us a little bit about your role. What does a CEO and a co-founder do for an identity company? Yeah, so let me uh, sort of uh, link up the dots there. So, you know, as I said, I was started out as a developer in the identity security, identity and security space, but um, I've been doing startups now for, for 25 years, and this is actually, Zilla is actually my third identity startup. So um, starting with a company called Netegrity, uh, way back in the early days of the internet, um, where we we actually created the first uh, LDAP-enabled single sign-on solution out there, and um, our our products did very well in the market. Um, and then Netegrity was acquired by Computer Associates, started another identity company called Avexa, which uh, was perhaps the first first company in the identity governance space. So we called it Access Governance back then. Um, and this was, of course, the mid 2000s when compliance was starting to become a big deal and identity compliance was something everyone needed. So, um, you know, um, Avexa as well, um, um, sort of uh, the Avexa products did really well in the marketplace. Ultimately, we were acquired by RSA. Uh, so Zilla is a company that my co-founder and I started in 2019, realizing that identity had sort of become much more business critical than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, the cloud had made identity the new security perimeter. And that 
that fact brought with it um, this notion of organizations really needing to think about identity as, as um, not just in terms of an identity provider, not just in terms of establishing um, the identity of a security principle, but also in terms of locking down the access uh, that identities had. And so we, we, we came up with uh, the idea that uh, this is really identity security. So while the last 10, 15 years in the cloud era has been about identity providers, uh, the next 10, 15 years are gonna be, is gonna be about identity security providers, right? And in some sense, that's the next generation of identity governance. So the identity governance and administration space was driven by uh, compliance and driven by life cycle management of access. But what's changed now with the new security perimeter is, uh, you know, identity security has become a key piece of that, of that equation. And cloud scale demands automation beyond what the last generation of identity governance solutions needed to provide. So, so a lot has changed and really uh, Zilla, the idea behind Zilla is think in terms of locking down the permissions, locking down the access that people, machines, and APIs have to enterprise resources, and do that in a way that supports security initiatives, compliance initiatives, and IT initiatives around provisioning, deprovisioning, and so on. So I'm curious about the name, Zilla Security. I'm always fascinated by how these names get picked. How did the name Zilla Security come to be? What's the, the genesis behind it? Yeah, so there's actually, uh, two two reasons why we picked that name. First, we wanted to be the Godzilla of of the identity space and the Godzilla of of identity security, right? So so that got Godzilla got shortened to Zilla. Uh, and second, uh, the word Zilla in in South Asia um, means district. So um, you know we thought it was quite appropriate to think about uh, district security, right? So it was Zilla security. So so we kind of came up with that from, from two angles and, uh, and the name was sort of bandied around for a while and then it just stuck. I don't uh, want to keep bringing up the legend term. And maybe we won't use Tom Brady. Maybe it's Roger Federer. I know you're a tennis guy, so maybe we'll just use that. But to me, it was like what really jumped out about that was, you know, Nettegrity was one of the biggest people on the block when I had my very first project. It was like, Z um, Netegrity, Oblix, and I think IBM Solution was already out at that time, right? I mean, those were the big like choices in identity, and there really wasn't much else. I think Sun had something at that point already too. So around like oh three oh four, and then Avexa. I mean, Avexa was the next big kid on the block with SailPoint, right? And now you're creating a new startup that's going to go ahead and compete in that really what's a crowded market. That identity governance market is kind of crowded and you're going to be competing against one of those firms that, you know, originally or products that you originally started up. I guess I'm wondering how does Zilla differentiate itself from the others in this space? And what what's kind of the gap that you're solving? Or what is the gap in the market that you saw, saw and said, okay, we can come up with a better mousetrap to solve this problem? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, um, the space, as we as we just discussed, identity governance has been around for a while, but um, it's been it's been you know it was the design center was on prem. It was very professional services centric. Very the solutions, most solutions in this space are very hard to deploy, very hard to use, uh, very hard to integrate with with enterprise applications. And as I was saying, focused mostly on compliance and lifecycle management, right? So in this cloud era, the opportunity we saw was to bring security into the mix to add a whole lot of automation. So the whole company is focused on innovating in terms of automation. And we've started, um, you know, uh, without AI, and now we're infusing the platform with AI. And then finally, you know, making identity governance simple, right? It's, it's been too hard to deploy. It's, you know, organizations talk in terms of an identity journey. In fact, the vendors talk about an identity journey. 
and the word journey really is a euphemism for pain, right? It shouldn't be a three-year, five-year, eight-year journey. Yes, you know, uh, these solutions and large organizations, there's a, there's a fair bit of organizational complexity and it takes a while to herd the cats and get everyone on the same table. But organizations should be getting value inside weeks, inside two months, three months, six months, right? Uh, so our solution was designed from day one to be really easy to use, really easy to deploy. Um, something, you know, we think the whole world is going to need. Businesses of all size are going to need an identity security solution, just like businesses of all side need identity providers today, right? That identity is the security perimeter. If you don't lock down that perimeter in terms of access, if you if you don't have your privilege controls in place across the enterprise, you know you're you're asking you're asking for a breach, and and that's what's playing out out there. If you look at all the data breaches happening across the world. They're all rooted in identity and access exposures of some kind or another, right? So, so how does how does how do all these organizations of different sizes truly go off and deploy a, a solution that can lock down the perimeter, lock down the perimeter, and at the same time, um, you know, serve the compliance needs, uh, serve the IT needs around uh, joiners, movers, levers, um, you know, there's. Identity is this holistic, is now this holistic layer that has to get deployed properly across the organization. And identity providers are a key piece of that. We see ourselves being the identity security provider that's going to step out of the mix and complement the identity providers out there. Deepak, you threw a lot of good breadcrumbs out there. We'll get to all of those, but before we go down that route, I want to bring you back because one of the things, okay, you've got this crowded market and I'm wondering what your approach was. It's not like you went and acquired some company that had a customer list, right? And that you're just basically building from there. So my question to you is what's kind of, what was your approach to the market? Did you go for the, you know, are you focused on the fortune 500 or even bigger organizations did you start with going after like building a solution for the middle market? What was the approach for Zilla Security? Yeah, so our approach was, you know, let's start with the companies that care about the cloud the most, right? So let's start with cloud-centric companies. And and over time we'll address the hybrid organizations, right? So um and and if you if you go back, so we started in 2019. Um, and if you go, if you go back and think about where most companies have been, the really large companies still have lots of on-prem applications, but it's these smaller organizations, you know, the mid market, the low end of the enterprise, that's almost entirely cloud centric today. So that's sort of where we started. And we said, okay, let's go to them. Let's not take on the on-prem mess inside most companies, right? Let's provide those cloud-centric companies with, with identity security, with identity governance, with the security compliance and join a mover lever automation they're looking for. But over the last year and a half, we've been going up market, right? And so now we're starting to go into the hybrid organizations. We're starting to support the on-prem environments, the on-prem applications, and we're starting to tackle the broader needs of larger enterprises. And, and that, you know, we're still not going after the, the massive organizations in the world, but, you know, in, in 2024, we're going to start uh, uh, heading in that, in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I was introduced to Zilla Security actually by one of my clients, and they started showing me around the, the platform. And, you know, I don't think you'll have to go after the large mega corporations. I think they'll come after you. <laughs> you know, they'll find the the solution and reach out to you. Um, but kind of what you just went through there, and I think it, it's probably obvious to me the benefit to the buyer is really like, okay, you, you've everybody's trying to be cloud first. I shouldn't say everybody, but the majority of organizations are, and I think a lot of that on-prem infrastructure for a lot of organizations is things that don't translate well to the cloud. But if you're kind of taking that to... Um, clients that you've already kind of solved most of the cloud space, I would imagine that's a large part of the 
the value proposition uh, as you as you move through that strategy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the larger organizations have a growing cloud presence. They're using infrastructure platforms like AWS, Azure, GCP. They're using SaaS applications. They still have the on-prem infrastructure, on-prem data, but what they need is essentially identity fabric. Uh, fabric's a popular word these days that works across the board, right? It doesn't really make sense to have a a solution that just works on prem and a solution that just works in the cloud. Its its identity is a holistic. It needs to be a holistic solution. So so our approach is while our you know while we run out of the cloud ourselves is to provide ways to to actually integrate seamlessly with with applications and infrastructure both in the cloud as well as um, as well as on prem, uh, and that that integration issue actually is perhaps the biggest differentiator we have. Right, we make that you know the last mile has all has always been a huge pain in identity management. So we focused very hard on making sure that integrations are drop dead easy. You know, it doesn't matter whether an application has a REST API or not. Uh, you know, we can integrate with it, and we can integrate with it so easily that in five minutes, someone can build a connector to an application. That's driving, in addition to the simplicity of the solution and the automation, that that integration issue is driving a lot of our success. So I think that's a perfect segue into, I want to ask some questions around the product itself, and I think one of the key features that I've seen out of it, and when I remember I saw it, I was like, oh, that's pretty neat, <laughs> was this idea of introducing RPA or robotic process automation into tools like this, which is not something that I've seen before uh, with you know other other players in the market. And you've got this thing called Zeus, which one excellent name can't go wrong with that. Zus Zilla Universal Sync. I guess for people who aren't familiar with what that is, can you talk a little bit more about Zeus and how that fits into sort of the master plan for for Zilla? Yeah, the challenge for us, uh, you know, in the early days was if we're going to provide an identity security solution, it has to work with the entire tax surface, right? So when we started connecting with companies, they said, you know, I've got, I've got applications, homegrown applications. I've got legacy applications. I have applications, lots of applications that don't have REST APIs. And what all the vendors are talking about is, is REST API integrations. We need you to help us with not just with REST APIs, but with all the apps that don't have REST APIs, right? So that's where the robotic process automation came in, right? We spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do we seamlessly and easily extract the accounts and entitlements, the granular entitlements, the group memberships, the roles, what have you, from applications of all kinds, right? And infrastructure elements of all kinds. And that led us to this idea that uh, the one place where that information is always available is in some sort of administrative console or administrative uh, uh, user interface for that for that system, right? So, and we said, well, since the web has become, uh, um, you know, the common user interface for these applications, if there's a way for us to parse HTML um, and figure out what the most common themes are, what the most common approaches are to displaying accounts and entitlements and roles and so on, uh, we can actually crack this nut. And so we spend a long time trying to figure that out. And, you know, the result is, is Zeus, right? So it is, it is, um, it is very cool uh, uh, robotic automation that just works. You can, um, you know, deploy it super easily. It can authenticate with, with whatever your authentication MFA environment is. It can bring up, uh, bring up systems um, extract the data and send it securely over to Zilla. And that, that helps us deal with all kinds of uh, systems that, that um, organizations are struggling with today. I'm going to barge in here because this was what was demonstrated to me again by a client, uh, someone who was responsible for access reviews. And I said, look, can you show me what this Zilla tool can actually do? And he brought me, he said, yeah, sure. So imagine I have this application that I need to do an access review of. And it's this cloud application. I go in here into Zilla and it's like within 30 seconds he had 
kind of the campaign defined and then he went out to the app and like i don't remember exactly what it how it worked but i, I think there might have been like a ribbon bar over the app and they went into user management for the app and then it asked them like highlight the area where the users are or usernames are and highlight the area where the email addresses are and highlight the area where the entitlements are. And then it was like, now it just basically created a access review based on like, you know, a, a business user going in there, not writing a script of like, Hey, hit this API and, and take this JSON file and tear it apart. It was like, just go into the page and like draw these squares over the data. And it was like, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, and Deepak, I know I'm like probably oversimplifying it a little bit, but you know, I think I was more technical than this user, and I know I'm not the most technical person, but it was like, you know, okay, pretty much anybody who knows how to use a computer these days can do that. A am I describing it well? Yeah, you described it very well, and that's what our customers love. Uh, you know, it's very easy for 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 an application owner. Uh, or, or a security staff or anyone to just create a, a web recipe for, uh, for bringing data out of, uh, out of a system that doesn't have a REST API. And it sort of goes back to the, you know, the idea of automation. It's, um, you know, this is automation that, that enables comprehensive integration across the enterprise. But we've, we've tried to kind of infuse the, the product our solution with with automation across the board, automation to make it easier for stakeholders to deploy our solution, automation to to enable um, it uh, reviewers to make decisions more easily, uh, security people to define policies more easily, automation to leverage tools like identity providers or ITSM systems or or security operation centers, uh, automation to measure business outcomes. So. You know, that's, I think that's the direction the space is taking. It is, um, you know, organizations have certain outcomes, business outcomes in mind. And, you know, they need to get, they need to get to those quickly, right? So no one has the time to, uh, or the money to go hire an army of professional services people to, to do all this work over, over three years or five years. You know, people want quick time to value and they want something simple that just gets them there. I mean, can you ask for a better commercial than having like one of your customers <laughs> talk through like, yeah, this is how easy it was to set up, right? And 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 they're talking to a seasoned identity expert, you know, Jim, I know you're not saying you're not technical, but 20 years in identity is nothing to, to sneeze at. I mean, that's that sounds to me like that's, you know, a CEO's like dream, right, is to have advocates from a customer standpoint telling others in the space about the product. I mean, it seems like, I remember when I saw that, I was like, Oh yeah, I've never seen anything like that before. Like, how does that work, and does it work, and what you know, what happens when screens changes, and and all things like that? Um, I guess I, I'm not even sure what the question is here because I remember being so fascinated by it, and I remember thinking, okay, like a lot of this is based on automation. That has, I, I'm not even sure what the engineering effort was to actually develop something like Zeus. I mean, how do you how do you even think about the different permutations that might be out there? from an automation standpoint to say, okay, we wanna yeah, highlight this area of text and this area of entitlements and even navigate pages and things like that. I mean, that must've been a pretty significant undertaking, I'm thinking, from an engineering aspect to pull that together. It was, it was. It took us, uh, it's taken us many, many years of effort. It's it's patent pending um, and we're still taking it forward. So there's um, there's a lot more we can do with it. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna continue to evolve, but but um, it is it is a huge differentiator for us, and it really makes our customers' lives easier. So I don't ask you a, a hard question, because I think this is top of mind for probably people is when they see and hear things like this. And I would definitely encourage people go to the Zillow website, zillowsecurity.com, sign up for the demo and watch how this works. But what happens if the screen changes? Is it easy enough for me to go back and sort of fix the the automation or the script or whatever that's running that says oh, okay? It used to be called this, or maybe the interface changed because I'm a SaaS provider and, you know, they like to mess around with their interfaces. How do I get around that fact? Because I feel like that's the first thing that comes to mind is like, okay, well, you know, screen scraping, which is kind of 
Ugh. <laughs> people have that nasty reaction to it. But you figured out a way, I think, to make that a little bit easier. And I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about how that might work. Yeah, that's a great question. So screens do change. Now, it turns out that the administrative side of um, of an application doesn't change as often as you might think. So people, you know, developers try not to muck around in that too, too often, but they do change occasionally. Now, the nice, the great thing about having a hun over 100 customers now is when, a, when an application's administrative screen changes, it, you know, we find out about it, you know, immediately, right? Because, because just think about that. It's, uh, the data collection is going to fail and we're going to get pinged and we're, you know, the Zilla support site is going to find out instantly that something has gone wrong with this particular application and the HTML has changed, right? So, so our engineers would overnight, will overnight kind of jump on that issue and be typically before a customer even realizes that, that a certain integration has failed, a Zeus integration has failed, we've got, we've got a solution for it, right? And then and once, you know, once the solution is in place, then it's really easy for the customer to go pull that pull that new recipe in and restart restart the uh, restart the Zeus the Zeus integration. So it, it you know it sounds like oh my God these things are probably breaking all over the place, but they're not. Do they break occasionally? Yes, but when they break, they can get they get fixed almost immediately as well. I love that idea of sort of almost crowdsourcing some of the information that's out there, but. This idea of recipes, you mentioned it earlier in our conversation, and you just brought it back again. So it leads me to believe that there is some sort of, I don't know, um, Rolodex. I don't know what the right thing a recipe card holder is. If I, is that how myself as a client, I would pick that up and say, hey, I'm a customer of Zilla and I have this recipe that I need to pull down for an application. Is that how it works or is there a different way? Like how do I, how do I take advantage of that recipe? Well, you actually don't see the recipe, so when the integration is built and you might be the one building it, you're really building it with the Zillas with Zeus. And so it's in some sense, um, a, a Zilla recipe, right? But it's a Zilla recipe for that application and that recipe gets saved and that get recipe gets saved in a way that enables it to be used by you, but also potentially used by, by other people. Not with your data, of course, but but with with their own data, their own applications. So I I you know the word recipe is sort of the underlying um, technology tidbit, uh, but it really doesn't surface um, to uh, to a typical customer. Deepak, I was asking you questions earlier about how you go to market, but I'm also wondering like who's your buyer in most organizations because you did mention the compliance piece. I know that the person that showed it off to me was doing the access reviews kind of governance focus. So I'm wondering about these different pers personas within an organization that buy and use Zilla. So are, is it like auditors, GRC leaders, identity practitioners, or are you selling to CISOs? Like who contacts Zilla or who do you contact at those orgs? Yeah, so the economic buyers are the chief security officers, the CISOs or the CIOs or the heads of IT. But invariably, there's there's folks that report into those those uh, you know those leaders who become champions of of our product, right? So if you think about the compliance driver, it would typically be someone on the identity team or someone on the GRC side who's responsible for access reviews or responsible for segregation of duties. If you think about the security team or the security operations team, it'll be someone who's who's involved in, you know, um, in nailing down the the security posture for the organization or in in identity threat detection, something like that. And then if it's um, if it's join a mover lever management um, or access request for employees, that's probably something that folks in IT will get involved in, right? So, so you know, the thing about identity is, and the thing about um, our approach to locking down access, locking down permissions is, it becomes one holistic identity solution that then gets leveraged by different teams in the organization. So, um, you know, the identity team certainly gets involved. 
GRC team gets involved, auditors get involved, uh, security team gets involved, SecOps, um, and of course the the folks in IT. Um, you know, we we actually leverage uh, popular ITSM systems for a lot of our workflow. So we've tried not to reinvent the workflow, uh, reinvent workflow for our own purposes. Uh, so we work very closely with systems like ServiceNow and and Fresh Service and Jira Service Management. And so those teams get involved as well, right? So there's a lot of stakeholders, which which kind of makes sense because identity is is unique in that it's one area of security that touches every aspect of of a of a business, touches so many business processes. So there's stakeholders across the board, right? But the people who actually you know um, uh, become champions of our solution are are typically on the identity team, the security team, or the or the IT team. It, it brought up an interesting thought for me, which was around integrations. And so I know a lot of organizations say, all right, we're going to, you know, here's all the requirements or use cases that we have. And when it comes to integrations to third-party applications, those that you can provision to or pull data from, you know, what is your approach to that? Is it that you have a lot of name connectors like, hey, we have a Salesforce connector and a Workday connector and these 50 applications, or is it more of like a standards-based, or is it really come back to the Zeus model, or is it a, a mix or a hybrid of those? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways in, way in which to integrate with the systems, right? So we talked about Zeus, we talked about REST APIs. Um, there's some applications, legacy applications and so on, that that simply have file imports. There's no, there's really no other way to get at the data. The only way to get at it is to export some sort of a report or export some sort of a CSV, a comma separated file. Uh, and then sometimes, particularly with on-prem systems or on-prem applications, you'll find databases that have that have permissions in them. And of course, you use SQL to get at those at those permissions. So, so we have a lot of different ways in which we could we could bring data out. Um, it really depends on it depends on the application. And when you walk into a large organization, typically they've got so many applications that you use one of, you know, you use thirty REST API integrations, thirty Zeus integrations, you know, twenty of those integrations. You use all the different types. And so our approach to that is, we've got, you know, over nine hundred at this point built-in integrations. They're just part of our platform. You can just start to use them immediately. But then you can build your own, right? Because it's so easy to build your own, right? And, um, and a lot of our customers will just go off and, and start, they'll use the built-in integrations. They'll have 10 apps, that 20 apps that don't have built-in integrations. They'll go create no-code REST API integrations, or they'll create you know the Zeus integrations we were talking about earlier. So what we're trying to do is to make that process really, really simple. And, and build a community around it. So um, over time, there's, there's always a Zilla integration for any application out there, right? Um, and if you've got some homegrown applications or web portals that only you know about or digital tra through digital transformation, you've built your own apps that no one else has, well, you can build your own integrations for those as well. I think I, I like that question a lot, Jim, because I think you know, we saw Zeus and we're like, okay, that's pretty cool, but it's not the only way, right? I'm looking at the website now and you've got API integrations and you can search, right? You got file imports. And as cool as Zeus is, it's not the only way to integrate with an application. I just think it seems to be like it's it's sort of that missing link, right? We see a lot of vendors in the space who have API integrations. We have a lot, and they also typically have some sort of file import, but there's really not anything in between that. And I think that's one of the differentiators that I've seen, Deepak, from from Zilla, is that Zeus offering, right, to be able to go in and sort of bridge that gap in a low-code, no-code way to really kind of solve that that in-between issue. <laughs> I'm probably not as articulate right. saying it, but it, does that resonate with kind of what you've been seeing from from your clients and out there in the field? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, they leverage Zeus, they, which makes it easy for them to to bring in the data. And as I said, it all kind of comes together in in the context of more and more automation to very quickly get to value, you know, quick time to value, make it make it simple, make it easy, right? Uh, that's that's the idea here. 
So let's talk about that quick time of value because I'm always interested in finding out, okay, sounds cool. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit jaded when it comes to security tools. Yeah, sounds really neat, Deepak. You know, how long does this actually take to get set up? What do I need to put in place? Um, I guess, can you talk me through sort of what does it actually take to get this up and running? Can you t- kind of walk me through that maybe in a very high level, step by step? We've got a process. We realize that particularly in larger organizations, um, there needs to be um, a, a deployment methodology that that that's well understood and guardrails for for an, for a deployment like this. But you know, the basic steps are very simple. You know, you first uh, tell Zilla about your environment, right? And that could be as simple as saying, "Well, we're using Okta for." single sign-on or using Microsoft Azure AD for single sign-on. Um, and, you know, Zilla can pick up the apps from, from the single sign-on solution, but that, that's perhaps only half the apps you have. Uh, the others you, you, you tell us about individually or you tell us, well, we've got uh, this information sitting in a database somewhere. We can pull it in from there. But the first step is essentially tell us about what's out there. What is your environment like? And then one by one, you start integrating integrating those apps. Now, I mentioned the directories and single sign-on solutions because that in you know that's where you you get your your basic notion of identities in the environment, right? It doesn't tell you about about um, the machines, all the machines you might have, or all the APIs you might have, but it certain te- certainly tells you about all the users and the workforce. Um, and and so as you start to bring all of this together, the system starts to now correlate the accounts and entitlements and all that granular information it's getting from the various applications or infrastructure elements or systems. It starts to correlate that to the identities from the directory, right? And it starts to create this complete picture of of who or what has access to what, right? It starts to identify, you know, what's, what's, um, What's third party? What's privileged? You know, what's a service account? What's an unused account? You know, and now that correlated identity and access map of the enterprise becomes a foundation for the compliance processes, the security processes, the join a move or leave or processes, right? So that's how the the identity governance and security features that we provide are essentially layered over that that access map. So you start talking about your direct resources and, and I, now I'm going back to the recipe. It's like, okay, you're, you're collecting your ingredients. You've got your process. Um, what is the, and here, two questions. What is the fastest time to value that you've seen to get something out of Zilla that's usable and, the, and you know, the client or the customer is happy with it? And then what's the average time? Because I know we, we all times hear stories of like, oh yeah, I got this deployed in 36 hours. Like, okay, that sounds really neat, but is that realistic? Is it more like, you know, from an expectation setting standpoint, is it generally around two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? Like, what do you typically see as like a normal sort of setup? Yeah, typically it's the order of, it's in the order of weeks, but there's a lot of variability. And, you know, the biggest issue often is who really has the knowledge and the credentials to set up those integrations, right? Because we don't need much, but if you think about a REST API integration, for example, we're going to need something uh, to get that going. And and oftentimes the person we're working with on the other side isn't the one who has access to that to that data and has to get an application, the technical owner of that application involved, even if it's just for 30 seconds, right? Um, so that's, that is often uh, the biggest uh, hurdle in, in getting going quickly. But usually it's of the order of weeks, you know, in a... In a mid-sized organization, it might be just two or three weeks. In a large organization with thirty thousand employees, you know, it might be six or eight weeks. Uh, if you if there's a organization with two hundred applications, it might take you know three months. But um, it's it's typically in the weeks and or 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 a couple of months before organizations start to get get real time to value. Do you find that there's a particular use case or something that? Uh, people tend to start with when they're implementing Zilla? Do they focus on access reviews? Do they focus on kind of plumbing, maybe onboarding, offboarding? Like what's been the go-to for for folks so far? Yeah, the, in the early days for us, it was access reviews, right? Because uh, we, our initial product was, um, had a compliance module, was focused on visibility and compliance. 
But all of that has started to change over the last year. So now it kind of depends on the organization. Some folks will start with just compliance with access reviews or segregation of duties. Others will start with visibility and security posture. They want to nail down the, the security exposures, the access exposures they have from a security standpoint. Uh, and, and, and we see some organizations that are starting now with, with uh, you know, life cycle management, with provisioning, with access requests. So it kind of depends on, on, the, on the company. It depends on you know, what, what they're looking for. But I would say that visibility is almost always, that's kind of a, a common denominator across the board because everyone's looking for, well, how do, I, how do I just get to see what I've wrought on my enterprise, right? What, because uh, folks don't even know all of the applications that they're using. Um, and so bringing all of that information into one place starts to give them that sense of, yeah, I've got my arms around this and now I can do compliance, I can do security, I can do uh, you know, life cycle management. Deepak, I mean, just thinking back through your history again, uh, Netegrity, one of the original web access management platforms, Avexa, one of the original identity governance and administration platforms. Um, now we're thinking about Zilla security. What's in, what's the next chapter look like within Zilla's story? I mean, you've got IGA. Do you continue to just make a more kick butt IGA platform, or do you go down this converged identity route that's so popular? What what's the next? chapter or a few chapters? Yeah, awesome question. You know, I think that identity security itself, the way we've just been talking about it, um, has a long way to go. I think organizations of all sizes are going to need a solution like this that's automated, that's simple, that just plugs into their environment and works, right? And so when we think about the future, you know, we're, we're always thinking about how do we make this simpler? How do we make it more automated? I think AI is going to, is going to change, is going to make this that, you know, so much better than it is, than it is even today. Um, I think the other, the other thing to consider, the other thing we think about is, you know, identity has been, hasn't really been a core security concern. And we've been talking about security posture management and identity threat detection and so on. But if you go and talk, talk to most SecOps teams today, they really don't understand identity that well. And I think that's going to change over the next five years. And it's going to change uh, partly because solutions like ours will, will evolve so that they fit right in to the, to the whole SOC ecosystem, you know, all of the tools that, that SOC teams are working with. So so I think I think it's all it's really all about more automation and and more simplicity and more more sort of uh, security more kind of fitting in with the security ecosystem and providing a streamlined solution for for identity security right so the governance um, again I don't I don't see the governance requirements changing dramatically there's always more regulation. But uh, the fundamental requirements are probably going to stay the same. There's going to be more and more requirements on the security side, right? Um, and I think uh, automation, there's going to be more and more automation needed. And so that's, that's what we think about when we think about the future. I love the idea of making things simpler because I think this is something that the identity industry and maybe security and other industries as well, but identity specifically struggles with very complex tool sets and things that are being done to simplify everything <laughs> from the deployment to the usage to the you know the the consuming of the information coming out of it i love the idea of that so you know i'll definitely be you know supporting you guys from afar so yeah make it easier <laughs> for people to do this stuff because that's probably the biggest complaint that i see from a lot of a lot of areas not just you know from the the, the process the technology side of it but that's great. I have this tool. I'm not getting the maximum value out of it. It's not easy to use. I think is a common thing that I hear quite a bit. So I love the idea of you know making identity security simpler. If it's simpler, people are going to get more value out of it. Is that fair? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Gartner says that the 50 percent of IGA deployments are in distress. So the legacy solutions just haven't served uh, the industry that that well. I mean, and 
you know, they were fine for an on-prem era. I think here we are in 2024 with, uh, with you know, rapid adoption of cloud systems all around us. And those solutions just, just aren't working. You know, you mentioned the word converged, and I just want to comment on that. I think this idea that, you know, organizations can, can you know, go down this vendor consolidation spree and simply use converged platforms for everything is a myth, right? Yes, some things make sense to converge, some consolidation makes sense, but but you have to think about which features hold together. It goes back to, you know, there's a natural, um, uh, a natural way about this. There's holistic solutions that hang together very well together, you know. You, you, you bring feature sets together when it makes sense naturally. You don't, you don't just throw things into a platform and say, I've got a converged solution. So um, although there's, you know, big vendors are always talking about how their platforms can do X, Y, Z and ABC, I think um, most CISOs see through that and best of breed is still very much uh, alive and kicking. Hmm. It's interesting. I was going to say something else, but then you brought up that piece and it made me think back to Netegrity was acquired by CA, and they also had identity. So they had um, Site Minder, Identity Minder, and Governance Minder. They were all products, and just because you put them under one brand name doesn't mean it's an appealing product. I mean, it really has to all work together, or we're not. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on that, but feel free to. But the other thing I was going to bring up, Jeff, I was going to steal one line that you used to say all the time. I haven't heard you say it in a while. But around this user experience, nobody teaches anybody how to use Amazon. You go into Amazon and you figure it out. And why can't identity systems be that way? Because if you're going to have self-service out there, and I think self-service and automation is kind of a theme for today, it, it, it just makes the whole thing work better you can make your whole identity ecosystem work with fewer people and have it be more efficient customer satisfaction goes up because people can do things themselves get quicker results so i think this user experience piece is not to be looked past you you described our vision for identity security very well right people should just be able to go up and start using it just like they use amazon right um, that is what that is what folks in IT security and compliance want today. Something that is easy to use, they can just start working with it. Um, so it's a great that's a great uh, it's a great point. We're not going to top that, so we'll start to wrap things up. Um, I, I love the idea of self service, and my cheesy segue from that is tennis and service. Get it? Ha ha ha. <laughs> um, <laughs> Deepak, we were talking before the show started, and you mentioned that you're into tennis. You've been playing for a long time. One of the things I like to do is end up kind of on a lighter note, and I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about tennis with you. I, I'll be honest, I'm a newbie. I have no idea what's going on in the world of tennis. I don't even think, I'm trying to think, I don't think I've ever swung a racket. I did play racquetball, which is about as close probably as I, I've gotten to tennis, but tell me about your tennis career. <laughs> Do you have a favorite tennis player? Is it a memorable match or something that you've played? Take me into the world of Deepak and tennis. Oh, I love tennis. I've been playing for a long time. I've been playing since I was a little kid. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, you know, you forget about, it gets you, gets me into the zone. You're out there on a tennis court and you're uh, hammering away on the, on the, at the balls. Um, so it's, uh, it's just, it's a great hobby. Um, Memorable matches, memorable players that I like. You know, there's a um, a kid. He's a sensation right now. Carlos Alcaraz. Uh, he is awesome uh, on the on the tennis circuit. And I remember a match that he played. I think it was last year at Wimbledon. Uh, Carlos Alcaraz beat uh, Novak Djokovic. Uh, it was a five set match, and it's one of the best matches I've ever seen. So, and I've seen quite a few. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a great. Uh, it's a great hobby. Um, uh, I'm not a pickleball fan. Uh, I know we were chatting about pickleball earlier. I think uh, pickleball is probably a fun game as well, fun sport as well. But I think uh, tennis has uh, 
uh, has more finesse. So I was gonna, I was gonna say, you know, the most challenging question I was gonna ask you today was about pickleball. I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but what is the strongest part of your tennis game? The strongest part of my game happens to be my backhand, mm. which is unusual. Most most people have a have a great forehand. I'm not a great player, by the way. I'm I'm just a club level player, but my backhand is is something that I developed when I was a teenager. There was this. Uh, there was this concrete wall. It wasn't really a tennis practice wall or anything. It was just a wall in the neighborhood. And I'd go hammer away on my backhand with, with a ball on that wall. And so I, I managed to develop a strong, a strong backhand. Uh, I, wish, I wish my forehand was as good as my backhand, but it isn't. Can you play with just backhands? I imagine that's a lot more running. <laughs> no, that, that, yeah, that, I, I know people who do that with their forehand, right? They run around their backhand. Mm -hmm. But somehow I haven't figured out, figured out how to do that with my backhand. <laughs> Jim, uh, how are you with uh, tennis? Not a very good tennis player, but, you know, when you brought up tennis, I started to think about, you know, Serena Williams was the guest, um, one of the guest speakers at Octa Octane two years ago. And, man, what a fantastic person. And it made me think of the time that, I don't know, she, like, complained and got loud on the court a few times. And then it got me thinking about John McEnroe and how many times he's gotten loud on the court. And it, what I really loved about John McEnroe is like, now he totally makes fun of himself, right? He, he totally uses that as like a comedy tool. I think that's fantastic. The other thing that got me thinking of is like, I don't, so I don't play much tennis, but I've golfed a lot. And what I found was the more I golfed, the better I got, but the more angry I got. If things didn't go the way I wanted to, wanted them to, or if I missed a shot, it's just like I would get completely angry. So I can totally see how, you know, a professional tennis player can totally lose, lose their cool when something doesn't go right or you have, I mean, everything is with these like high tech cameras now, but before all that existed, if you felt the ref got the call wrong, blow a gasket, I can see how that could happen. Deepak, any tips for, for Jim on how to keep calm on the tennis court? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but you're absolutely right about, about uh, McEnroe. He's perhaps the most ill-tempered player ever, right? Who is, a, who is a bigger bad boy of tennis, John McEnroe or Andre Agassi? I think John McEnroe. Ag Agassi was was a was a rebel, mm -hmm. right? Um, he was uh, um, he wasn't. I mean, he could he could lose his school as well. But um, McEnroe was a repeat offender many 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 times. All right, I wanted to ask you about pickleball, and I saved the most controversial question for the very end here. Tell me about your thoughts on pickleball because I think you kind of alluded to it before, but I feel like. You know, in the Asheville area of where I live, North Carolina, there is this very, very much a struggle between the tennis players and the pickleball players. I'm not sure what the struggle is, but I'm hopeful that you can demystify it for me. <laughs> I think pickleball is probably a great sport. I've never played. I just worry that all the tennis courts in my neighborhood will get taken over by pickleball folks. So that I don't want. So, I, uh, you know, uh, but it's a great sport. I know it's... Uh, uh, there's a lot of people who've started playing pickleball. Uh, there's a mall near, not so far from my house, where they now have um, an anchor store has been replaced by 16 pickleball courts. So, um, you know, that sort of thing is probably going to happen in in lots of neighborhoods around the country. But where I will get word is when when my tennis courts start disappearing and getting replaced by, by pickleball courts. So that would not be good. So it's really more of a real estate question at this point. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Let's, I think that's a good spot. We can leave it. Um, Deepak, thank you so much for taking the time with us. I would definitely encourage folks to reach out. We'll have a link in our show notes for people to reach out to you on, on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll have links to Zilla security, Z I L L a security.com where people can check out more that you guys are working on. Uh, there is a very shiny green button in the upper right hand of the website, Zilla Security, where you can book a demo. So we talked about kind of seeing is believing. I think that would be you know great for people to go check out and actually see how this works. And uh, definitely, I think people will be impressed by what they see. So I think uh, 
we've had a great show. I always like to leave on a high note. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Uh, again, links in our show notes. Deepak, thank you so much for being here. And thanks again for sponsoring this episode. You can find Jim and I on LinkedIn as well. So if you've got feedback about this or anything else, feel free to drop it on us. And uh, you can find us on the web, idacpodcast.com and on Twitter or X or whatever it's called when people listen to this at IDAC Podcast. So with that, thanks everyone for listening and we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com and find us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. See you next time on Identity at the Center.